Welcome everybody to our webinar this evening. We have the pleasure of hearing Dr. Jessica Steen from Nova Southeastern University's College of Optometry talk about therapeutic innovations, the game changer. changer. Dr. Steen uh, is a graduate at the University of Waterloo School of Optometry. She did a residency at Nova Southeastern University College of Optometry uh, it, with me, and she was one of my disease residents. We are very, very fortunate to convince her to join faculty where she has been since her, since her residency. She is an, an assistant professor at the College of Optometry where she is up for promotion to associate professor. She is in the glaucoma service having taken over when I left. She teaches a course in glaucoma as well as ocular pharmacology. She is a, a gifted clinician and a gifted speaker uh, makes me feel good uh, having having clinicians and colleagues around like Jessica Steen because it tells me that our profession is clearly in good hands going forward. So with that, it's my great pleasure and your great pleasure to, to see and hear Dr. Jessica Steen talking about therapeutic innovations, the game changers. Jessica, please take it away. Thank you, Joe, as, as always, for that very warm introduction. Uh, Greg and Vanessa, thank you again for having me back. Now, if I was lucky enough to join most of you or some of you last month uh, with an OEC webinar, thank you for joining us again tonight. You know, we know that there are many opportunities for continuing education, so thank you for choosing to spend your Tuesday evening with us. So where we are moving to tonight is this realm of pharmaceutical development and therapeutic development. This is really beyond just thinking about the medications that we prescribe to our patients on a daily basis, but we really wanna take this from a big picture understanding approach as well to really understand the framework that new therapeutic agents, specifically those that represent these first in class, real game-changing therapeutic innovations are developed within. You know, we really see this as a long-term process from when the concept of identifying a treatment target in a laboratory setting to developing a potential therapeutic that acts on a particular treatment target to moving through the clinical trial process to then submitting that data from clinical trials to a regulatory agency like the FDA in the United States to ultimately have the regulatory agency come to a decision about whether or not a particular new therapeutic agent meets their strict and highly guided criteria of being both an effective agent, but also an appropriately safe agent. You know, this is a long-term process that I really see as being similar for anyone like myself who has that artistic creative appreciation. I always like to share a bit of, uh, of myself with you. And this is an image of NSU's art museum that's located in downtown Fort Lauderdale. For those of you who are local in the South Florida area, you know, it's an excellent gallery museum to visit. For those of you who are outside of South Florida, it is a wonderful time to visit this area this time of year. It's really analogous to that process of thinking about an artist in their studio alone day one, thinking about a new concept for a new creation and working through not only the creative development process, but also relying on the bigger framework, the potential donors, the potential funding agencies, the museum board of trustees that may make a decision about whether or not that particular painting or that particular piece may then be uh, purchased and displayed in a gallery, allowing the public like us to be able to appreciate those works. It really is a similar process that spans many years and often involves many individuals outside of only the scientists and clinicians in a laboratory and pivotal trial setting or the artist and, and the artistic community. So it's something that we're going to take this big picture, but we are going to kind of evaluate the framework as well as the new drugs that are currently used and some of those which are currently under development, which I truly am excited about and have the potential to completely change the course of long-term disease management for patients 
patients with posterior segment disease, anterior segment disease, and often changing the, the course of the disease process for patients who may have not had the types of therapeutic uh, options uh, that are currently available to open that avenue for new therapeutic availability and options. Now, important for tonight's lecture that everyone knows, I have no financial disclosures uh, related to any of the products that we will be discussing. So to continue from where we left off, last month when I joined you, we spoke about uh, development of retinal agents and treatment of retinal disease specifically. And you know, one of the underlying themes has been and is how we as optometrists really stay up to date with therapeutic agents to be able to prescribe uh, the best possible agent and the most appropriate agent for a particular patient. So I thought that I'd share a couple of the resources that I particularly like to help me to stay, uh, with, stay up to date on what's new and what is coming. So on the left side, I've just taken a screenshot of a couple of these um, emails that come out, typically once a week. These are particular uh, bodies that don't send daily communications that overwhelm us, but just a once weekly general update within the realm of eye care. And of course, in 2020, 2021, updates within the realm and treatment modalities of COVID-19. So through Medscape Ophthalmology, it is an online opt-in type of program. Uh, this is a once weekly uh, um, update on kind of the biggest topics within eye care of the week that relates to therapeutics, clinical trials, uh, other more neurodegenerative conditions, as well as general testing. Uh, we have data about visual fields, about clinical findings. It's a nice well-rounded resource. Using on the right hand side, this is a, a, a grab from iWire News. Uh, so, iWire.news, another opt in program where once a week we get an update about what is new and exciting with more of a focus in biotechnology. So, we see more of a financial interest and more of the biotech aspect rather than possibly direct patient care. Now, I included this older screenshot from just after Thanksgiving to really remind ourselves of how rapidly the field of therapeutics is changing, not just within eye care, but the process that we've gone through as observers and some more uh, hands-on certainly than others uh, within managing patients during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're very proud of all of our colleagues that are able and that have volunteered uh, to uh, be injection providers, vaccine providers uh, through um, the emergency orders that have been put in place uh, to allow increased access to patients for the vaccine. Now, more recently, an update of thinking about new therapeutic agents, new surgical platforms that are available will touch on that very bottom, that last uh, middle of February update regarding a new agent for the treatment of presbyopia, which of course impacts a very wide number of individuals. So we're going to break this down generally by thinking about first anti-inflammatory agents that tend to have a potential for elevated intraocular pressure and stem into this realm of immunomodulatory agents. We're going to talk about some of the new therapeutics that act to lower intraocular pressure and those that are available for treatment of anterior segment conditions and those for the treatment of posterior segment conditions. If at any point there are any comments or questions, I know Joe's going to moderate the chat. I have it up as well. I'm happy to discuss or, or answer any questions as we, as we move along. So let's start with this woman. She was on vacation in South Florida visiting a family member and had woken up the, the morning prior with a sudden reduction in vision in the left eye. She's 72 years old and she is systemically well. She takes no ocular medications, no systemic medications. And whenever we see or smell the signs of a potential unilateral case of optic disc edema, especially in an older individual, there is certainly one condition that jumps to the top of our list as far as ruling in or ruling out in a timely matter 
to uh, because of the potential for long-term vision loss, not only in the impacted eye, but in the fellow eye as well. She had no headache, no scalp tenderness, no jaw claudication, or some of the more uh, less specific but more generalized symptoms that can sometimes come with this condition causing systemic inflammation, just general nausea, fatigue or malaise, or just a change or reduction in her appetite. She is spry, she is feeling well, has her hair perfectly, perfectly quaffed in office, and she has count fingers vision in the left eye with an afferent pupillary defect. So when we see this type of presentation, you know, one clue clinically that we look at is the history of vision loss. This is a sudden onset vision loss in an eye that has had cataract surgery previously. But when we look at the optic nerve, we're looking for features of this optic nerve that may give us a clue. I would call this nerve kind of a hyperemic swollen optic nerve, which is very different from a clinical presentation that we may think more in line with something like a systemic condition causing uh, inflammation and secondary optic disc edema, which can sometimes cause more of this chalky white pale optic nerve. So I see a hyperemic unilateral swollen optic disc. The hyperemia is a clue that this patient uh, does not have the condition that we all think about a potential worst case scenario. So as we work through our differential diagnosis in any condition, you know, certainly we often start with the potentially uh, life-threatening or vision-threatening conditions at the top, the most significant, and really work our way down towards a diagnosis of exclusion. So we can think about optic neuritis, but the red flag for us is thinking about giant cell arteritis with this particular patient. This patient is not on systemic medications, uh, but we do certainly have to keep in mind the potential for systemic medications, including amiodarone, to cause optic disc edema. While systemically applied medications typically can cause or typically do cause bilateral optic disc edema, there's often significant asymmetry. So it's not, it's not uncommon for a patient to present with unilateral disc edema, not because it's a truly unilateral condition, but because one eye is more affected than the other eye, the fellow eye may just be lagging behind in this clinical appearance of disc edema. When we think about space occupying lesions or compressive lesions, you know, this history of sudden vision loss is fairly atypical with profound vision loss. Typically, compressive lesions are slow growing lesions that over time cause a slow, progress uh, progressive, painless type of vision loss, which does not describe our patient's appearance. This, could this patient have neuroretinitis? Could this just be a CRVO that before we see the vascular changes uh, that we see this unilateral swollen nerve? Or could this be the diagnosis of exclusion uh, of non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy? Well, how do we work through this type of presentation? You know, it really comes down to emergent evaluation and then continued care from there on out. Does this patient really need emergent same day laboratory evaluation? And if so, what tests are we thinking about? Well, these are how we evaluate the acute phase reactants or those blood markers that may be distinctly elevated in a case of giant cell arteritis. So the acute phase reactants that we did in this particular case investigate and should investigate are a complete blood count with differential, C-reactive protein, and the erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Or, and, does this patient potentially need emergent neuroimaging? And if so, what imaging studies may you consider? So based on the presentation of this particular patient, our greatest concern was ruling out giant cell arteritis. Based on the optic disc appearance, you know, we had a suspicion, this hyperemic optic disc, that it seemed to be more similar to a clinical presentation of non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. 
Remember, as we're examining patients, we have an advantage for patients with two eyes is that we always use and can always use the other eye as kind of a gauge as well. What did the optic disc look like at the other eye? Is it a disc at risk, a small cup to disc ratio? Is this a patient that you may say is at risk of an arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy? And in this particular patient, uh, that was the case. Now, we did not order emergent uh, neuroimaging in this case, but we certainly did order acute phase reactants for the concern that this patient may have had an atypical symptomatic presentation of giant cell arteritis. Now, what is GCA? It is systemic inflammation. There is significant inflammation throughout the body that primarily affects these medium to large size vessels. And what happens is that with inflammation, with inflammatory upregulation, specifically, there is upregulation of a pro-inflammatory pathway, a, a particular cytokine called interleukin or IL-6. And what happens when this pathway is upregulated is that inflammatory cells infiltrate these large blood vessels and make a large lumen or vessel diameter very small. The blood that is coursing through these larger vessels also becomes turbid and thicker because of the presence of the infl inflammatory cells. So what do we end up with? Well, we've got a very, very, very narrow pathway for blood to pass through. And we've got sticky blood that takes up a little bit more space. This leads to vessel occlusion that blood isn't able to get from point A to point B causing significant ischemia and vascular occlusion. So how is this condition treated? Well, it's significant multi-system inflammation. So these patients do require very high dosage, uh, very high doses of systemic steroids. If a patient is diagnosed based on clinical evaluation and laboratory studies with giant cell arteritis, or there is suspicion based on uh, clinical evaluation and laboratory studies of giant cell arteritis, even if that patient has not yet undergone a temporal artery biopsy, patients are often uh, taken into the hospital and are provided with an intravenous methylprednisone uh, drip significant systemic inflammation needs to be treated with very aggressive anti-inflammatory agents. Long-term, these patients, because of the, uh, this systematic uh, inflammation, often need long-term oral steroids. And we're talking in general, high doses of steroids over a long period of time. Periodically, steroids will attempted to be tapered. Of course, we want patients on the shortest course of medication in the lowest effective concentration as possible. But many patients with giant cell arteritis have long-term inflammation that requires long-term steroids. So what's the big concern here? Why are we concerned about a patient who may need long-term oral steroids to effectively treat their ocular and systemic condition over a period of multiple years? Steroids are wonderfully effective agents, but because we have steroid receptors throughout the body, it means that there are widespread side effects from these medications as well. Beyond cataract and elevated intraocular pressure, you know, if your patient didn't have diabetes before their uh, giant cell arteritis diagnosis, based on the amount of systemic steroids that patient is going to require, they are absolutely going to develop dysfunction of blood glucose. And these patients certainly do require careful, close continued monitoring with their managing primary care doctor, potentially their internist or an endocrinologist throughout the course of steroid therapy to keep their blood glucose and blood pressure within a, a healthy range for them long-term steroids wreak havoc on the GI system. And especially for your female patients, this is something that long-term steroids do cause significant changes in their physical appearance that can be significant. We're talking about widening of the face, kind of that uh, loss of almost that long neck, that buffalo hump classic appearance uh, that throughout the body, significant fluid retention. The other concern, especially with our female patients, is the development of osteoporosis with significant steroids. So this is something that while steroids are extraordinarily effective when provided on a systemic level, there are widespread side effects and they're not a perfect agent. 
So this really leads us into the trend that we have seen and are continuing to see within medicine, which truly makes sense. You know, instead of thinking about an agent like a steroid that acts throughout the body to suppress inflammation, how about taking more of a targeted approach? Find the pathway that is upregulated in an abnormal way, identify the pathway, find a treatment target that can effectively treat that pathway to reduce any downstream effects that result in the disease process that we see. So this is very much a very targeted approach versus a widespread uh, effective, but approach that has significant widespread side effects. The agents that focus on specific targets within the immunologic system are what are called biologic agents. And these are bioengineered compounds. So these are often uh, include medications like monoclonal antibodies, uh, certainly that we've seen for the therapeutics involved in COVID-19, but also more traditional anti-inflammatory therapeutics for treatment of, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, uh, medications like Tanercept or Infliximab. These are typically medications that are either injected or uh, uh, either intravenously or subcutaneously. And these are different medications when we think about our rheumatologic colleagues who treat, medication, uh, who treat patients very frequently with um, anti-inflammatory agents that are not steroids that fall into a category that we call disease-modifying anti-rheumatic agents, the DMARD agents, that include things, for example, like Plaquenil. Those are typically oral agents. They're well absorbed orally, whereas biologic agents are not orally well absorbed and often need to be uh, injected. So let's focus first on Actemra. This is tocilizumab. This is what the subcutaneous pen looks like, but it's also available as an intravenous infusion. And Actemra is truly a game-changing agent for patients with giant cell arteritis. Now, in giant cell arteritis, patients will always first at diagnosis require high-dose steroids. But the goal of adding this particular therapy, this biologic agent of tocilizumab, in addition to oral steroid or intravenous steroid therapy, is to reduce the overall amount of steroids long-term. So steroids are still central to treating giant cell arteritis, but the goal of adding a biologic agent like tocilizumab is to reduce the overall amount of steroid that that patient requires, and therefore reducing some of those widespread negative side effects effects that happen with oral steroid use. This is a medication and something that we've seen and will continue to see that uh, was initially approved, FDA approved, for conditions other than giant cell arteritis. It has, another, it has additional approvals for juvenile idiopathic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and something called cytokine release syndrome, which is something that you certainly have heard of recently. Now, as far as COVID-19, especially early last spring, you know, we were often hearing these terrible stories about individuals who were diagnosed with COVID-19, who weren't feeling well, who had a fever, mild shortness of breath, but who were possibly, uh, who uh, had been in the hospital due to COVID-19, but were overall talkative and able to function. And then suddenly they hit a tipping point and went downhill very, very, very quickly, may require mechanical ventilation and may never have come off of mechanical ventilation. You know, what happened in these patients that were seemingly doing quite well and then took a really significant, very sudden turn for the worse? Well, the concern is the development of this widespread acute respiratory distress syndrome that's caused by an uncontrolled release of pro-inflammatory cytokines called often a cytokine storm. So there is a significant tipping point that's reached where the body responds by producing very high levels of inflammatory agents and inflammatory cytokines as, a, as kind of the tipping point that leads to multi-system organ failure in certain sick individuals with COVID-19. Now, one of the particular inflammatory markers that is very upregulated in patients who experience this cytokine storm is 
our good friend, interleukin-6. There are many uh, interleukins and cytokines that are elevated, but IL-6 represented a very interesting target for researchers considering that there is already an FDA-approved uh, medication that is an interleukin-6 blocker that had been approved for other agents. So theoretically, could prescribing or uh, administering tocilizumab to hospitalized patients prevent these patients from really going over that tipping point that is a, a terrible downstream impact. Now, the other thing that we've learned through the last year is we've really had a firsthand front row view about how medications are trialed in a clinical setting. Now, doctors, of course, we make, as doctors, we make the best decisions that we can based on the evidence that's available. And this is uncharted waters for uh, the management using therapeutics for patients with COVID-19. Now, a year later, uh, we are seeing uh, more well-established treatment algorithms, but early on in the disease course, it really felt like every day or every week, there was a new favorite and a new not so favorite that fell off of that list as far as a therapy therapeutic option was concerned. So tocilizumab was investigated very early, and there are a number of clinical trials, both in the United States and internationally, uh, that are currently being evaluated to determine the impact of tocilizumab on COVID-19 hospitalized patients. Now, there are many treatment recommendations. Uh, one of the governing or one of the bodies in the United States that is a highly reputable uh, association, the Infectious Disease Society of America, is one of those governing bodies that uh, does put out updates as far as therapeutic options, including the data that supports those therapeutic options. And very recently, based on interim results from one of the ongoing clinical trials of tocilizumab in the United Kingdom, the IDSA, this Infectious Diseases Society of America, has recently uh, included tocilizumab as one of their recommendations recommended agents for hospitalized patients with COVID-19 in addition to standard therapy, which is systemic steroid. So tocilizumab, before it was kind of being investigated as could potentially have a benefit, it's received a strong recommendation now to be part of the therapeutic regimen for certain individual, individuals hospitalized due to COVID-19. So it's something that theoretically makes sense based on the mechanism of how this drug works, but very important to see it in a clinical setting show improvement for patients as well. So I feel that through this, you know, you guys get to know me reasonably well, but I really don't get to know you that well. So tonight I, I'm curious, these are curiosity poll questions that I have for you. You know, first thing, you've all been asked this many times, but I am curious about your thoughts on the COVID-19 vaccine and kind of where you're at in uh, potentially the therapeutic cycle. You know, ironically enough, Jessica, this is usually one of our test polls when we start. It's, it's an excellent question. And I'm sure you've seen this change so significantly, Joe, through the time that you've been doing these web webinars. So it's something interesting to see the progression. You know, our students at NOVA have been late to being uh, able to have access to the vaccine, but now most of our fourth year students and some of our third year students have been vaccinated. They're all in the process. It's something that really is kind of an interesting gray area. When we think about ourselves, uh, depending on where you were vaccinated, I know I had to bring my Florida optometry license to show that I'm a, a provider for patients in a clinical setting. You know, our students are seeing patients as in, in direct contact, or they are in direct contact with patients, but they don't have a license the way that we do, which has been something that has uh, prevented them in certain circumstances from being vaccinated. Wonderful. You know, the majority of you are, are on your way and hope to be on your way soon. That's excellent. So thank you for that. So another biologic agent I want to introduce, because it really gives us kind of an idea of the bigger picture here, is a, a drug called Inspring. This was a drug that is a biologic agent that was approved over the summer for the treatment of a fairly rare condition called neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder. Now, NMO 
SD, as it's often abbreviated, it sometimes has a clinical appearance that can be, from our per clinical optometric perspective, similar to, an, uh, to uh, a multiple sclerosis type of appearance with optic neuritis as sometimes a presenting sign. Now, there are inherent differences between multiple sclerosis and neuromyelitis optica, and therefore the therapeutic options are different as well. Now, those four letters, something that you'll, you'll continue to see, not just tonight, but uh, moving forward as far as keeping up with therapeutics, you're often going to see four strange letters that don't really go together after a generic name of uh, an active biologic agent. So we see satralizumab dash MWGE. What does that mean? Well, those four letters indicate a specific FDA approved biosimilar agent. So we'll mention about biosimilars and how these are really different from, or potentially I should say, different from their branded counterparts in a way that's kind of similar to a generic versus trade small molecule topical eye drug. Now, the interesting thing about this approval over the summer was that this particular manufacturer uh, and this particular agent was eligible for two of the programs that exist in the United States to try to expedite drug development uh, of new agents. So there is, uh, there has certainly been a push by Congress to enhance the ability of Americans to have access to new high quality medications, which involves activity. To, uh, to try to improve that drug development process for particular medications. And this drug was eligible for something called orphan drug designation and fast track designation with the ultimate goal of having good quality, effective therapeutics approved in a streamlined way so that they can be prescribed to patients. So biosimilars are often determined or often called as being analogous to small molecule topical, for example, topical generic eye drops. But these biologic agents are very different. Biologic agents and biosimilars are not carbon copies of each other as generic medicines are to their small molecule branded or trade drugs. These are very complex living molecules. These are three-dimensional, large structured proteins. And what the goal of a biosimilar agent is, is not being identical, but having the same clinical or therapeutic effect. So this is something that when we see biosimilars versus biologic branded medications, you know, our experience is, well, shouldn't they be a lot less expensive and shouldn't biosimilar agents represent a significant cost savings for patients over original or innovator drugs? Well, often there is a reduction in cost to patients, but it's not as significant as what we see with oral medicines or topical ophthalmic agents. And the difference really comes from the complexity of these molecule molecules. Biosimilars cost a lot to produce and manufacture, meaning that they may be less expensive than the innovator drug, but uh, it's not a significant cost savings as we see with topical ocular medications. The other difference is that a biosimilar agent can't be substituted by, uh, by, uh, by a pharmacy uh, for the original innovator agent. So what does that mean? That means that doctors need to be provided with the scientific and clinical evidence of what those biologic biosimilar agents can truly do, which involves marketing dollars that is passed down eventually in the cost overall to patients. So while they are similar to the concept of a generic medication, there are inherent differences that make biosimilars much more complex than uh, what a generic drug may be. So let's focus on a couple of these pathways. Excuse that me, Jessica, when, you, when you're talking, if, you, if, if I may, if you're talking about the cost, and I was helping some people, I'm not sure if you may have said this, and I apologize if you did, but did you talk about the cost of tocilizumab? I didn't mention it. You know, I didn't. Uh, have you had experience with that recently, Joe? Well, it, it, it is on restricted formularies because of the cost. You're probably talking about $2,000 per month at least. 
And it's something that, uh, you know, one of the challenges that exists is not just the approval of these medications. So, you know, of course, there are the many challenges that stand between us as a prescriber and our patients having a good therapeutic outcome and being able to get the medications that may be prescribed. And, and part of that comes down to options that are on the table in the approval process. And the other big barrier that certainly exists for many patients as part of this very complex landscape that we're in as far as insurance coverage relates to cost and approval and improving access to uh, particular medications. You know, starts with having these medications approved, but really is just a small part in the story for many particular individuals. So that's an excellent and always underlying point to keep in mind whenever we talk about these new exciting drugs, there are the sides that what is the very, what is the proportion of patients that are truly going to be able to have access to these medications in the United States. And that's often, unfortunately, a small, very small subset of the overall patients that need them. So one of the uh, areas that can improve the ability uh, of having therapeutic options through Congress has been the designation of something called the Orphan Drug Act. So conditions that affect less than 200,000 people a year in the United States are considered to be rare drugs. And the concern that Congress had in the early 80s was to say that for drugs that don't affect that many people, pharmaceutical manufacturing companies may not have the greatest incentive of trying to spend and invest significant dollars into finding a drug that treats these rare conditions. And maybe their money is best spent elsewhere for a greater return on investment. If you have a, a drug that treats a condition that 50 million Americans have versus a drug that treats a condition that a thousand Americans have. So there are federal tax grants as well as contracts that help to support the pharmaceutical in, uh, clinical trials that need to exist. The tax credits that exist are 25%, a significant chunk of clinical trial costs. This was a big uh, downward uh, trend from 2018 when before 2018 and earlier, there was a 50% tax credit that companies were eligible for by investigating treatments for rare diseases. Maybe the most important thing is having the exclusivity of being able to market their drug in, uh, in the United States for seven years at the very end of the approval process. We know that uh, the process from laboratory development to the time to approval, if a drug is approved, is often five to 10 years. And often patents need to be developed and need to be applied for very early on in the process. So often by the time that a drug is approved, they may have only a year or two years left on particular patents. So this seven years after the date of marketing approval is huge. This also allows for flexibility within the design of the trial. You know, it's certainly much harder to recruit patients that have uh, a rare condition versus patients who have a much more common condition. Now, fast track designation is another avenue that can be, uh, can be elicited for pharmaceutical companies to try to uh, help the speed of having their particular product uh, available to the population. And this is something that was developed in 1988, what was going on in the United States. This was really the height of the AIDS epidemic with no therapeutic known options at that point. So this was really developed as an incentive for researchers to develop treatments for HIV and AIDS that at that time had no real therapeutic options. So this, you'll see fast track designation drugs, uh, drugs, uh, drug candidates that are eligible for fast track designation are the ones that are kind of these first in class medications, very important for the drugs that are uh, being investigated for the treatment of geographic atrophy. We'll talk about this a little bit later, but geographic atrophy has no true treatment. There are many uh, companies and products that are in the clinical trial process with some really, really remarkable results to try to have a therapeutic option for patients with GA. So how did this impact specifically this rare condition of neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder? Well, in 2018, 
not so long ago, there were zero FDA approved agents. But for this very rare condition, now there are three FDA approved treatments. So the goal is to try to get safe and effective products available to patients, theoretically, in a timely but safe way. Now, the biologic agent that I think we are probably all most familiar with is adalinumab. This is something that has been advertised heavily on television and online in the last year. This is a subcutaneous injection. Cost is always a factor. Uh, not uh, if we're paying cash price for this particular drug, it's about $5,000 for two pens, which for the treatment of non-infectious uh, intermediate posterior or pan uveitis, patients typically need two injections as a loading dose and are typically injected every two weeks. These are patients who require long-term treatment. Of course, cost is an impact. Now, the other interesting thing about adalinumab and Humira specifically is that they are reaching the end of their patent, uh, uh, their patent date. So their patent expires on this particular drug in 2023. Now, right now in the United States, there are five FDA-approved biosimilar agents of adalinumab. Now, the reason why you haven't heard of them is because they aren't able to be marketed because we're still in that window of patent protection. But these drugs are ready to go. Uh, manufacturing is ready to be ramped up as soon as that patent expiration happens. So this is something that we are entering into really a new phase with not just new medications, but opening the avenue for these biologic biosimilar agents uh, that are really going to change the face of many of the medicines that our patients rely on. Now, where marketing comes into play is what is advertised, not the old original Humira, but new Humira citrate free. And how is it advertised? Something that we would all choose over an original molecule, a less painful injection. You know, if ever given the option, do you want the injection that hurts more or the one that hurts less? A hundred percent of the time, you know, our first gut reaction is, of course, to take the new agent that may hurt less. So this is already the next step to try to train not only doctors, but also patients to ask their physicians for this new branded Humira Citrate Free. This is a big chunk of uh, uh, the particular manufacturer's overall um, uh, income. Uh, and this is something that is an eye care realm, not only has systemic implication, but Allergan uh, is now part of and was purchased by the drug maker that makes Humira called AbbVie last year. So Allergan now an AbbVie company. company. What is AbbVie's primary gold standard drug? It's Humira. These biologic agents are have the advantage of focusing specifically on a particular pathway. With Humira, it's uh, down-regulating or blocking a pro-inflammatory cytokine called TNF-alpha. The good thing about targeting TNF-alpha and why we see Humira as a drug that is so commonly used for systemic inflammation is that we should, in a healthy circumstance, have zero TNF-alpha in our bodies. This is not something like VEGF, where we all have in our vitreous and all have in our retina, just in a very low concentration, and in ischemic states is upregulated. We, in a healthy state, should have zero measurable TNF-alpha. So any TNF-alpha that is present, this pro-inflammatory cytokine, is pathological. Yeah, Nelson, uh, Dr. Rivera, you are on to something exactly. This is a different patent. It is citrate free. There has been a tweak to the formulation. So this is a way that while that original patent for regular Humira expires in 2023, this is something that there will be new patents associated and there are new patents associated with Humira citrate free that are going to extend longer term. So you hit the nail on the head with that one. 
while these TNF alpha inhibitors and biologic agents are, are targeted and, and wonderful without the widespread side effects of steroids, they are not perfect and there are always risks that are involved. There's the potential for unmasking of multiple sclerosis. We know patients who have intermediate uveitis, this could be an early sign of multiple sclerosis. By prescribing this type of agent, this could make underlying multiple sclerosis that was not clinically apparent previously could unmask that condition. For patients that have underlying infection as an immune suppressant agent, there can be reactivation of those systemic infectious conditions like tuberculosis or hepatitis. There can be autoantibodies that form and produce kind of a separate category of a lupus-like type of inflammatory autoimmune syndrome. And there's some described discussion about what is the risk of lymphoma in patients on TNF alpha inhibitors. And this is a controversial topic, you know, like anything, is it really the drug that increases the risk of potentially lymphoma or is it the underlying condition? Because we know patients with autoimmune disease are at an increased risk of developing lymphoma. So is it actually the drug itself or is it the underlying disease process? So because of these potential risks, patients are uh, ser seriously considered for therapy before initiation, and they will undergo a complete physical evaluation with blood eval uh, uh, serological evaluation and testing to ensure that there is not underlying tuberculosis that is asymptomatic. Now, testing options for tuberculosis, you know, as we're thinking about managing uveitis, and our serological evaluation for patients who you may seem, may you whom you may deem necessary to undergo serological evaluation. Keep in mind the options for tuberculosis testing. We can talk about the classic purified protein derivative testing, the PPD skin test, where tuberculin is injected just under the skin and the patient needs to go back the next day to have their body's immune reaction uh, read in conjunction uh, in a clinical setting. That requires two visits for a patient. You've got two opportunities that a patient may not go back. Now there is a serological based test called quantiferon gold that is truly my preferred test to rule out uh, or be concerned about um, to underlying asymptomatic tuberculosis. Quantiferon gold is a serological test. Uh, the advantage that it also has, many of our patients who are in South American or from South American countries have had injections over time that would make them likely to have a positive response on the PPD skin test. Uh, this is, they would not have that same reaction to quantifuron gold. And patients may undergo an MRI. There are laboratory requirements when patients are taking TNF alpha inhibitors long term. So while these are excellent agents, there is close monitoring that does need to occur. So this brings us to kind of our second poll. Just again, a question of curiosity that I have for you. How often do patients really ask you about things that are advertised on TV or things that they've seen on the news? This could be products or new pharmaceutical products, or you know, we've had a lot of discussions about COVID-19 with our patients, about the vaccine, about treatment options, about the condition. You know, how, how do your patients use you as a resource, uh, as I think it's something that truly speaks as a compliment when patients do ask us about things that they have questions on that they may see advertised. I think I've seen this in, in our practice much more commonly. I think that patients want, have more questions than ever and are looking for answers. And I think look to us as valued sources of information. Yeah, Jessica, when, when, when they ask me, I, I usually tell them, if you see it advertised on TV, you can't afford it. Forget it. It's true. It is, it is the classic type of, uh, of response. But when we talk about therapeutics, yeah, if that's exactly something to keep in mind is the option and the availability. And if they, if they see it advertised in a magazine, maybe they can afford it. How does social media play a role then? You know, that might be, that might be an option. I, I, I do see some of the new um, HIV prophylactic medicines that are, are being advertised a lot in, on, uh, in, in magazines. And they're about $1,600 a month. Yeah. And they really just amount to a combination of, of two existing medicines that if taken uh, individually would probably be less than $500 a month. 
And that's the reformulation versus real new products. And that's a very important distinction to make. You know, what we often see is repackaging of existing products and kind of a new formulation and advertised as a new product. And that's very different from true first in class types of medications. In the eye care space, there have been many examples of reformulations of old products to kind of look new again or kind of be more exciting. But there have also been many new first in class types of products as well. So let's talk about some of these actually kind of more repackaged agents in different forms. When we think about the injectable steroids, these are not new steroid molecules. We're still talking about dexamethasone, we're still talking about fluocinolone, but instead of being applied either topically or as an immediate release agent, these are long-term sustained release agents that are on label for treatment of ocular disease. Really an exceptional example of, of not new agents, but advertised as new products that exist. You know, something like DexiSuit, the dexamethasone intraocular suspension, where this bolus of medication is injected at the conclusion of cataract surgery to reduce the need for the patient to be on topical medications after the procedure. There is significant cost that is involved for this procedure-based therapy, but certainly does improve adherence by removing the component of adherence of a topical ocular steroid. Something for us as Florida doctors, uh, Dextenza or the dexamethasone insert. Again, it, it's this kind of almost spongy-like punctal or canalicular plug, it doesn't actually, it doesn't have the same purpose of a punctal plug. So epiphora is not a significant concern with this medication. That's often a question that comes up. Tears are still able to move through the canaliculus, but there is a, a, this type of, of, uh, of insert that dissolves over time that is uh, impregnated with dexamethasone. And again, this is meant as a long-term treatment for slow release of steroid after specifically cataract surgery. Now it has this bright highlighter yellow uh, color to it. So you can transilluminate that clinically to see if it is still in place. Now this is exactly it. What other new steroids are there? Well, there are no new steroids, but there are those steroids that are newly available to us that are compounds that we know and love, but just in new concentrations and for different approvals. So are these really game changers? Not really, but I do include them because they are certainly medications that we see and have access to. So lodopredinol is available as a high concentration as 1% called Inveltus, and it has the advantage of improved post-surgical dosing being less frequent than something like our typical Lodomax gel as twice daily uh, installation for treatment of post-surgical uh, inflammation. Now, the newest kit on the block from the same manufacturer is a lower dose lodopredinol molecule. So 0.25% called Isuvis. What's interesting about Isuvis is that it is a short-term treatment for a chronic disease. You know, think about that for just for just a moment, a short term treatment for a chronic disease like dry eye. How does this play a role in our treatment algorithm? Now, this is meant to be used four times daily for the treatment of dry eye disease for up to two weeks. Now, interestingly, the way that this drug showed its effectiveness and safety to the FDA was through a couple of clinical trials that evaluated, first of all, the patient's symptoms. So there was an improvement in the patient's symptoms related to dry eye, and we know that the placebo effect is real. So there was about a 12-point improvement with the drug in comparison to about a nine-point improvement with the vehicle alone. So for certain patients, you know, they did wonderful on just an artificial teardrop alone versus the active medicine. The other uh, scale that was included, which I think is interesting, was improvement in redness. As conjunctival hyperemia, the, the line was drawn together to say eyes that are red are inflamed and uncomfortable in patients with ocular surface disease and dry eye disease. So an improvement in conjunctival hyperemia means that this medication works well. 
you know, certainly there are some the questions there that we know as clinicians to say, does this medication really improve dry eye disease long-term? No, but it is meant as a short-term treatment for uh, ocular inflammation. So as dry eye disease is a multifactorial condition, this is one of the medicines that certainly can possibly play a role. Now the newer Lodomax that uh, we I choose to prescribe to patients typically over the traditional Lodomax 0.5% because of the manufacturer incentive coupons for patients. So Lodomax SM submicron technology, these are very small particles. This is a lower concentration, but a similar clinical effect. This means that these, these particles penetrate the cornea more effectively and are dissolved and are removed uh, from active of circulation and are metabolized more quickly with a lesser likelihood potential for side effect, including IOP spike. One of the pathways that Lodomax SM utilized is something called PDUFA, or the Prescription Drug User Fee Act. Most medications currently in the ocular space will apply to use PDUFA. Now, what it means is that a drug company pays an additional fee to the FDA to have their particular products uh, data evaluated within a certain time frame. It's something like saying, you know, you can trust uh, the U.S. Postal Service to get your package somewhere eventually. But if you're trying to make your niece or nephew's birthday by a particular date and that package needs to be there by a date, we're going to shell up the extra dollars to ship FedEx with a deliver by a uh, confirmed date because we want it there as quickly as possible and needs to be by a certain date. This is a much larger scale, but it's really a very similar approach that the FDA gives an end date by which they will determine whether or not that medication has met the criteria for approval or not. So this is something that has been a, a subject of criticism. You know, if you're paying extra money as a pharmaceutical company, does that mean that you have influence over those FDA scientists that are then uh, evaluating your product? You know, we certainly, the individuals that are employed by the FDA are true experts and scientists within their field their biggest role is to ensure the safety and efficacy in a balance of a particular product. You know, they don't guarantee that a product is safer without side effect. Really what their role is, is to evaluate the data that is submitted by a pharmaceutical company based on the clinical trials. And then to determine, first of all, is that data sound? Did they report this data in an appropriate way? And are their scientific methods appropriate? And for the clinical benefit that was shown, is there an appropriate balance of safety? What that typically means is that a medication that has very limited potential for clinical benefit has to be absolutely squeaky clean safe for the balance of safety and efficacy to be favorable. That being said, the FDA certainly would consider greater potential side effect when there is a significant therapeutic advantage over existing products. So it's really all about the balance. And that balance extends into kind of the public perspective that, you know, if the FDA moves too quickly, it's the approach, well, they must not have done their due diligence in evaluating a particular product. But if they move too slowly, they're potentially keeping drugs off of the market that could potentially save patients' lives. So it really is the public persona and the perspective of balance and efficacy that if you know, you're an individual with the FDA, it's really often a thankless job and really tough to come out on top. So Thinking about new drugs, I'm curious, you know, Isuvis is available, it does exist. You know, have you tried it, number one? And for those patients that we know need that kick of an anti-inflammatory effect, what's your drug of choice? You know, generic predacetate is a very reasonable option, or do you prefer something like Lodomax SM? So that's exactly, Dr. Rivera, Alrex is approved as Lodomax 0, as uh, Lodopredinol 0.2% with the indication for the treatment of ocular allergy. So it's a different clinical indication and a different concentration. 
So many options that exist. We know that these patients often need a short-term pulse. And what do you like? What's your go-to? I'll tell you my go-to is often generic prednisolone acetate 1%. Uh, it's effective. It's generic. It's often affordable for patients. While Lodomax SM 0.38 is often kind of my second go-to option. And I have not yet prescribed Lodoprednol 0.25%, but I'm curious if anyone has. So yeah, you know, absolutely. They're all, they're all excellent molecules. So some of you have had uh, experience with lodopredinol 0.25%. Uh, and many of you kind of stick with what is generic, what is most affordable as Lodomax, uh, as even a generic agent or uh, Lodomax SM. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, Jess, I have, uh, this is Greg, and uh, I have used probably... Uh, probably 12 doses of Isuvis and uh, probably prescribed three of those so far. Um, the, well, it works well. You know, I think the cool thing about it is, and, and our, our doc put up there about, uh, you know, LREX. And I think the coolest thing about Isuvis is one is that we finally have a drug that's on label for dry eye. We all did it before, but we never had a drug that was on label for it. So I think the biggest thing that we have to thank Cala for is getting us a drug that is now on label. It's all right to do things off label whenever it's the standard of care, but we haven't really had any drug, any steroid out there uh, that really was approved for dry eye. Um, now the cool thing, uh, I guess the unique thing, not the cool thing, but the unique thing about Isuvis is for it's approved for the flares in two weeks and so on and so forth. You know, and that's kind of how they're promoting it is you know, people with arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, you know, they, they get these flares throughout the year and then, you know, you have to quiet them down through maybe, you know, some steroids or some uh, higher end, you know, anti-inflammatory. And so it's only been out since um, I've had it in my office since December and uh, I've used it. It works well. Um, the drawback is it's not on any of the drug formularies because all the drug formularies for next year are being approved right now. So they're working with a pharmacy in Texas called MedCure and, uh, they can get it for uh, a patient for, um, $50 or $75. And it's a nice big bottle. And it, the whole idea, it's not to be used chronically. It's for when these flares come up. So, um, it seems to be, a, you know, a, a kind of a niche product or a niche product. Um, so, uh, you know, but again, I'm glad because we finally have something that's approved at a low dose, right? 0.25% because we all know that we always want to use steroids at the lowest amount. So that's my input. Yeah. Thanks for sharing, Greg. You know, it's one more option and that's really exactly what it comes down to. I, I like the comments uh, that came in generic Maxitrol, since my patients are poor, you know, Maxitrol has gone up for us. You know, we used to say it was about $4 in this, in this neighborhood, at least it's gone up to about $15. So it's not like it used to be in the good old days, but still a wonderful option that you have the anti-inflammatory and, um, and anti-infective effect. So one thing I wanted to share with you, kind of something that has recently come across my desk many, many, many times and across my screen many times is the change that we've seen in prescribing electronically. No longer can we just prescribe one bottle of latanoprost. Our electronic medical record system no longer allows us to do so. It is red flagged out. We need to now include the bottle size. So it's one more thing for us as doctors to be aware of is not just the medication, you know, not just the medication, not just, um, not just the concentration, not just the right uh, uh, signature or the way that the patient uses the medicine, but also the bottle size as well. So one more thing to keep in mind, and you know, as we're really talking about drop size, how is this calculated? So how much medicine, medicine should we be prescribing our patients to last for a particular period of time? Well, you know, not to get into the math at this point, but solutions uh, based on insurance coverage and pharmaceutical standards standards, pharmacy standards, allow for 20 drops per milliliter as solutions. That's different for suspensions. So suspensions allow 
15 drops per milliliter with the understanding that there may be more medication that is released from each dropper for a suspension rather than a solution. So you can kind of break down to determine how long a particular bottle is expected for a patient to last to prescribe, for example, a one month supply or a three month supply, a six month supply, or, or longer if you so choose, to try to make sure that our prescribing patterns match what is going to be approved and accepted within the pharmacy for the same period of time and by the patient's insurance. This is asking a lot. And in a practical sense, I wish or it was as clean. So I share with you a couple of examples of, of uh, you know, how this doesn't actually work the way that it's supposed to. A latanoprost prescription, I get a message back from the pharmacy that 10 milliliters of latanoprost is supposed to last 74 days, which is not 20 drops, uh, 20 drops per milliliter. And Travaprost, which is also a solution, a 7.5 milliliter supply suddenly miraculously lasts for 90 days. So you can work through uh, based on what should be an approved dosage for your patients, but you very well may still get challenges or questions from the pharmacy. It's something that we are all on our toes all the time. Now we know that there's variation in drop size and often uh, many drop droppers release more medication. Sometimes they release a lot less medication than what would otherwise be expected. And bottom line, there's variation. And in general, a bottle will last longer than what uh, the day supply is. Now that accounts for patients missing their eye, putting two drops in, saying that maybe they forgot to use a drop so they put another one in rather than uh, underdosing. Uh, so it's something that in general, it gives us a ballpark of how long medications supplies should last for our patients, but each bottle can have significant variation. Now, would there be, uh, should there be a push to change bottles? We know that the drops that are released by a particular medicine are much uh, too great for the eye or the conjunctiva to really hold. And as soon as we blink, a lot of that drop is, uh, is released from the eye, it drips onto our cheek. So that is wasted medication that that patient or we pay for. So if bottles were redesigned to, re to produce or to release less medicine, there would be less, to less overall waste. But it's not that easy of a process of redesigning all of the bottles of these topical medicines that we know and use. It, uh, every portion of a particular medicine is approved by the FDA, including the bottles themselves. So if there is an overhaul of topical ocular eye drops, uh, there is going to be significant cost for the manufacturer. And that's certainly something that we are going to see passed down to the individual. There was a push for the Supreme Court to hear about a class action uh, discussion about wasted medication uh, that disappeared about a couple years ago, but it is and always has been at the top of mind to say, how can we design a more effective and efficient bottle for topical ocular medications? So let's touch briefly on medications that lower intraocular pressure. Now, this young gentleman, he was 27 when he presented for his first eye exam. And the reason why was because his vision wasn't so good in the right eye. And he thinks that it just kind of gradually reduced. But the vision in the left has always been clear. He has a significant afferent pupillary defect. And he has reduced vision in the right eye as well. That is significant. We measured pressures which were significantly elevated. You know, now what do we think? Well, of course, we looked at the anterior chamber angle. We dilated the patient once we determined that the angle was unremarkable. There was no evidence of pigment dispersion, no recession, no neovascularization or peripheral anterior synechiae. And this is what we see. Now, these fundus photos are taken with the center view camera, which is really, it's called the compass. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful camera. More so for retina is my preference than optic nerve. The optic nerve, it's a wide dur field fundus photograph. Uh, the optic nerves are overall small and the coloration is a little different. Now on the right hand side, this is the eye with reduced acuity. And what we're not looking at is true optic disc pallor. We are looking at 
really no neuroretinal rim. So this is not a pale optic nerve. It's just that his long-term elevated intraocular pressure and glaucoma has damaged the neuroretinal rim to a point where we're not looking at neuroretinal rim. We're really just looking at uh, at sclera at this point. In the left eye, the eye with good acuity, yet we see he's got significant damage in the superior neuroretinal rim, pretty good nerve, uh, uh, neuroretinal rim inferiorly. This patient certainly has advanced glaucoma and thin corneas. His visual field, we gave it a shot. We thought that he might be able to see a little better than 2400 based on the way that he was managing in the clinic. Uh, you know, Greg, you always talk about what is the mean deviation of a blind eye. Well, this is a young patient, uh, pretty close at this point, minus 33.75 decibels with uh, significant visual field damage in the fellow eye as well. So what do we do? This patient has high pressure. He is often lost to follow up. We did start him on topical medical therapy, which he responded very well to. Look at that. We had his pressure down at the 18 millimeter mark, more than a 50% reduction. And he likes to disappear and, and take holidays from his medications. Should we be considering something else like laser therapy or true surgical options? You know, at a first line type of treatment, you know, what do we typically consider? Well, we know that SLT is a very reasonable first line option for patients with ocular hypertension or open angle glaucoma. From a medical standpoint, you know, prostaglandin analogs, you know, we certainly say that there's got to be a reason why we don't start a patient on a prostaglandin analog if we are considering medical therapy as a first line, uh, first line agent. When we think about maximum medical therapy, you know, we've got our traditional agents, prostaglandin analogs, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, beta blockers, alpha-2 agonists, now rokinase inhibitors, pilocarpine may still play a role. So let's just touch very briefly on these newer prostaglandin analogs. Visalta has been on the market. We've had clinical experience with it. It has an addition as opposed to a medication that breaks down into uh, that is latanoprost alone. This is latanoprostine bunot, that the molecule itself is latanoprost acid and this compound called butane dial mononitrate. Now, butane dial mononitrate releases nitric oxide into the eye. Now, nitric oxide isn't easily packaged into an eye drop, so it needs a vehicle to be released uh, within the eye. And that's what that butane dial mononitrate does. It's really the, the vehicle for nitric oxide to get into the eye. And uh, there is a clinical effect of nitric oxide that adds an additional IOP lowering impact of, you know, maybe two, maybe three points to latanoprost alone. There is, this is not a, a preservative free option, but it is a benzalkonium uh, BAK, benzalkonium chloride free agent, uh, preservative agent that exists as latanoprost. So not preservative free, but doesn't use that traditional harsh BAK as a preservative agent. Really something that isn't, again, kind of a niche product for particular patients, uh, specifically with dry eye. Uh, or whom you may be concerned about a uh, particular surface disease. And this uses not a typical pharmacy um, um, pathway, but we need to use the particular manufacturer's preferred pharmacy, which is called a direct pay model. Now they don't accept insurance, but there is a fairly reasonable price for a three month supply of this particular medication. From an electronic prescribing perspective, how that what this means for us is that in our EMR, we have to prescribe this medication directly to the specific pharmacy, either Transition or Capstant RX. So it's something to keep in mind as a therapeutic option, removes the insurance barrier, and there is, it's certainly more expensive than generic latanoprost, but is an additional option for our patients. Now the rokinase inhibitors, these are a new mechanism of action. This is not repurposing, this is a new mechanism. And these medicines as rokinase uh, proteins, how these, how these molecules act in the normal state is by regulating the contraction of smooth muscle. This is very important, especially in the trabecular meshwork. By relaxing the trabecular meshwork to increase trabecular outflow, 
This is something that these molecules are being investigated and are being used in areas outside of glaucoma management, also to reduce scarring as part of cardiovascular procedures uh, and corneal procedures as well. So we have natarsidol as ropressa, and we have in combination natarsidol yeah, to rokinase inhibitor as roclitan. You said it. That's exactly. So this combination agent, which uh, is a once daily medication with two medicines in one bottle. Now, what do we expect from our patients? We expect redness. You know, this is more redness than what we expect with the prostaglandin analog. It's something to make your patients aware of. Typically that redness improves over time. You know, if that patient just gets through a week or two of treatment, it often does improve. Something to be aware of are often small, typically small subconjunctival hemorrhages. These are not something that typically patients would, uh, would uh, be able to see themselves, but something that you may see behind the slit lamp and a little less common, but what I see in our, in our clinical practice, maybe even more common than what was reported in the clinical trials is the presence of this corneal verticillata or the pigmentation at the level of the cornea. It typically starts, and if, if you watch for it very closely, you'll see just a very fine horizontal line that's a little bit pigmented in the inferior quarter of the cornea. And what happens over time is that isolated tiny little horizontal line kind of sprouts legs from it that is this whorl-like pattern. That is something that is considered an adverse effect of the medication, but does not impact patient's vision and is not something that for me is a reason to discontinue the medication. It is something, if we're talking about adherence, I know the patient's using the medicine if their eyes are a little bit more red and they start to develop this corneal verticillata. If you do choose to stop the medication for any reason, that corneal verticillata does regress. So where do they fit in? You know, they're wonderful. So as natarsidol, the rokinase inhibitor, I think ideally as a second line agent, you know, they work uh, a little bit better what we've seen uh, with lower intraocular pressure. And I think, you know, these are often uh, very important uh, medications that drop intraocular pressure in certain individuals by much more than was th what was shown or what is expected based on clinical trial data. So it's something to keep in mind as these medicines have been around for a longer period of time, we've certainly seen that uh, this particular medicine is covered or these medicines are covered by more insurance plans. So it's something else to help to improve uh, our patient's ability to get these medicines. But you know, how do you justify any medication that might be more than $4 uh, for a five milliliter bottle of Timolol half percent? You know, excellent medications, but cost is always a factor. Now, the sustained delivery implant that I think is, is really neat and is something that is FDA approved and is being used is a repackaged formulation of bimatoprost. This is a sustained release uh, product that it is a very, very small amount of active ingredient that is slowly released over time. A surgeon injects this little pellet of uh, bimatoprost in an office-based setting and it floats to the anterior chamber where it lives and lasts for about six months and in some of the data, even a lot longer than six months. Right now, this is typically being used as kind of a last resort medication. It is uh, prior to surgery. This is something that is approved as a procedure. So is covered under Medicare Part B, not Part D, where our pharmaceutical products would otherwise be covered, but this is considered to be an in-office procedure, which can improve the ability for certain patients to have access to it, but only under Medicare at this point. It seems to work a lot better than what you would expect. This is only two to three drops of Lumigan, but has a six month or greater clinical intraocular pressure lowering effect based on uh, the, this medication being in close contact with the uveoscleral pathway, number one, but also to have this slow sustained delivery over time versus a bolus of medication that's released once per day. It doesn't cause the eyelash growth that topical prostaglandin analogs cause, and it doesn't cause the same redness because this medicine does not have exposure to the conjunctiva or to the eyelashes. 
you know, my first thought was, wow, this is going to change everyone's iris color. Think about this. This medication is directly in contact with the iris. That certainly doesn't seem to be the case. And the reason why is that this is only the equivalent of two to three drops of Lumigan. This is a very small amount of active ingredient. So something to be aware of that certainly does exist and is being implanted successfully and very effectively in many of our patients. Under investigation is another bimatoprost product, uh, this ring that sits in the fornix that is uh, inserted and removed over time. There is another uh, repackaged Travaprost implant that's currently in its late stage of clinical trial. Uh, that is injected directly uh, through the trabecular meshwork into really anchored at the level of Schlem's canal to provide a high concentration of Travaprost directly into the area where it should be needed. Something to look out for that may be approved in the next uh, possibly eight or nine months. Now, not to go into detail, but really what I wanna highlight is that the way that we manage patients with elevated intraocular pressure is something that has evolved and is continuing to evolve. It's not just our traditional medication step therapy when or if they fail, move on to surgery, which might be a laser, and then move on to incisional surgery. When to consider procedure-based treatments has significantly changed. And access insurance coverage is something that often dictates or allows uh, different pathways to be, uh, to be passed through, depending on your patient's clinical diagnosis, but also the insurance coverage that they have, which may allow access to procedures like MIGS-based procedures or uh, laser type therapy like SLT. So when to consider surgery, you know, surgery is not the old tried and true incisional surgery that we once all thought about alone. Surgery now includes these uh, uh, procedure-based medication options, as well as laser procedures, which certainly do play a role in the management of our patients in addition to medications. This doesn't replace medications, but another tool that certainly does exist. So touching briefly on these, again, new old medications, Upneak has been a, a, a big discussion point. Um, it is something that is now approved for Florida licensed optometrists to prescribe to patients after a significant delay based on our uh, traditional formulary, which may be something that is disappearing based on uh, the outcome of the proposed House and Senate bill that are currently being discussed. So Upneak is, an, is oxymetazoline. This is the same active ingredient that is in over-the-counter Afrin. It's an alpha-1 adrenergic agonist meaning, think about it this way, it constricts every blood vessel that it comes into, uh, into contact with. Now, the advantage here is, you know, we always, we always talk about this, Joe, that one person's side effect is another person's desired outcome. So when you talk about oxymetazoline and alpha-1 adrenergic agonists, well, they constrict blood vessels. Well, in higher concentrations like phenylephrine, they dilate the pupil, but they also cause contraction of Mueller's muscle in the upper eyelid, improving ptosis temporarily. This has been a carefully formulated concentration that doesn't seem to have significant dil pupillary dilation impact, does improve ocular redness, but seems to act preferentially on Mueller's muscle to pull that upper lid upwards by contracting Mueller's muscle. Again, this does not allow for insurance coverage. It's a direct pay model. You've got to use their particular pharmacy. Uh, and it is something that means that we need to prescribe only to the designated uh, pharmacies that do exist. So another option for patients, if you haven't received samples, look for them soon. Now, something that is a brand new medication that again in Florida, now we can prescribe for patients, cost is a significant issue, but so is neurotrophic keratitis. You know, this is kind of the bane of a corneal surgeon's existence. There's no worse thing than a neurotrophic cornea. You know, you can make the cornea look pretty, but if it has no capacity to heal or maintain that, uh, that healthy structure as it's neurotrophic, you know, it doesn't matter how perfect of a corneal transplant or how perfect of a healing 
healing process that patient has after a corneal event. If the cornea is neurotrophic. This patient has the potential for a significant bad outcome. This is a recombinant human nerve growth factor and is used on label uh, six times daily for eight weeks. The patient themselves has to draw up the medication with this specific pipette uh, using, and these are individual pipettes, and then instill a drop in each eye. Something interesting, we know it works based on the data from clinical trials. There were about 39% of patients reported some so sort of adverse effect. And what was the most common one? Discomfort, redness, irritation, pain, all of the things that you may feel if you have a cornea with uh, active corneal nerves. So again, this is a, a side effect, but truly a sign that the cornea does have some capacity to feel discomfort. That is a very good thing for an eye that was previously neurotrophic. So something to keep in mind for patients as a last resort with true neurotrophic keratitis. Now, the other medicine that exists, hey Jess, yeah. Let me make yeah, a comment right. on that because I have about an N of 12 with uh, Oxervate and I have some pretty cool video and I can maybe share that for you. You can drop it into your into your presentation, but uh, um, that that is kind of a neat, I have a patient that reports that her eye and it's, I probably have three videos of it, three different patients. They report that their eye is like sore, sore but it feels better. So it, it's, it's kind of a unique and it is, it's the, the eye is coming back, back to life. Um, so they report, they come in, they're all excited. Their SPK is getting better. Their, 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 um, you know, their kind of their geographic atrophy of, of staining, uh, is getting better. It's resolving, but yet they'll say, yeah, my, my eye feels better, but yet it hurts. You know, it's kind of a, kind of a weird sensation, but it's, it's, it's actually returning that homeostasis back. So it's kind of a cool medication. So that's excellent. You know, it's an incredible molecule. That's excellent that your patients are, are having such success with it. Actually, now, just, just to go back to Upneak, I've been yes. using quite a bit of it. And I, I had a question myself that I answered. And, and if I had the question, I think maybe other people would. Does Upneak work in Horner syndrome? And the answer is really not. Because I, I had a, as we were talking earlier, I had, I had a fresh Horner syndrome. Aproclonidine, Iapidine works, worked very well to, to diagnose her. And is actually very therapeutic. And one drop of Iapidine will work probably for one to maybe two days to keep their lid up and, and, and symmetrical. But I tried some Upneak and, and my patient said, it lasted for a couple hours. Not, not nearly as good as, uh, as Aproclonidine. That, that is interesting with Horner's syndrome. You know, if you contact the representative, it's RVL Pharmaceuticals, they would be happy to supply you, RVL Pharmaceuticals to supply you or, and make a visit to your office if you're allowing uh, visits. You know, Upneak works for me. I've got ptosis on my left side. I've had multiple intravitreal injections. It's really from the speculum that causes damage to the lids over time. And not only, you know, when I'm dilated, a drop of phenylephrine draws that lid way, way up, but Upneak brings my eyelid up uh, a little bit higher as well. But interesting that it doesn't have that same good clinical effect in patients with Horner's. So this particular medication for the treatment of thyroid eye disease, I think is truly is really hits many categories as far as considered to be game changing. When you talk about treatment of thyroid eye disease, it's really about masking the condition and, and trying to kind of cover up the effects of the condition treating the ocular surface disease, steroids as far as, and, and, or, and potentially decompression. These medications and these treatments don't impact the actual disease process. When we talk about the kind of condition that causes thyroid eye disease, these are not patients with run of the mill hypothyroidism. These are patients with true autoimmune thyroid disease, which uh, is something that is very important because it impacts how uh, the pathway the abnormal pathway works to cause this soft tissue expansion, 
and uh, proptosis, secondary dry eye, lid retraction, the stare type of appearance, uh, this orbital uh, muscular expansion and soft tissue expansion that can cause uh, compression of the optic nerve and optic neuropathy. So what really happens is that there's an activation of inflammatory markers that leads to fibroblasts, blasts uh, cells, blast cells, building cells in the orbit that cause uh, expansion of soft tissue and swelling of that tissue. So this is identification of the abnormal pathway, number one. Now design a product that targets something within this pathway to prevent it coming to its end stage and causing the clinical appearance that we know is thyroid eye disease. So this is Topeza, a monoclonal antibody infusion. It acts specifically on insulin-like growth factor one, and it blocks activation of insulin-like growth factor one receptor, which blocks that downstream pathway. So there is no activation of T lymphocytes. There is no activation of those building blast cells. There's no uh, development of expansion of hyaluronin, and there is no soft tissue expansion. So this is an intravenous infusion. The cost, you know, has been discussed as upwards of about $100,000 for a treatment. Uh, something that I, I found to be really interesting and concerning at the same time, I, I had a patient just recently, uh, thyroid eye disease, young. She's in her early 50s and has gone through the ringer. She's had Botox injections. She has been on courses of oral steroids on and off, but it's really for the ocular surface disease and the significant proptosis and lid retraction that she does. She's tried it all and she's been out of options. This is really a, a, what I had seen as a, a perfect candidate for Tepeza. The other thing that made her a perfect candidate is she is well insured. Now our local, um, uh, our local ocular, um, uh, oculoplastic surgeon who is using Topeza evaluated the patient, uh, applied for insurance coverage, and the patient was accepted. So her copay ended up being, she said it would have been about $20 per infusion. Uh, so every three weeks over 24 weeks for this $100,000 treatment. And the patient decided fairly recently that she wants to wait. Now, not because her symptoms have improved, not because she doesn't have thyroid eye disease any longer, but because she found out that this is a new medicine. It was approved about a year ago, and she wants more experience in the general public before this infusion. It's something that public perspective and uh, news media outlets and the discussion about the approval process, you know, information is always a good thing, but what is much better is certainly well vetted information. And this is something that her and I had spoken about afterwards, and, and she's still certainly not convinced, uh, but this is something that uh, is something to keep in mind that many of our patients have, have lost trust or don't have significant trust in uh, large systems. And you know, how can we provide them as optometrists with the best quality of information so that they can have the best potential outcomes? You know, for Hashimoto, as far as a specific indication for Tepeza, I'm not sure. But if this patient has secondary, this is autoimmune thyroid eye disease and symptoms, uh, based on the clinical appearance of proptosis, they should be eligible for this particular treatment. You would have to double check the package insert to see if there's a specific exclusion criteria for Hashimoto's. Well, the answer is gonna be yes. Hashimoto's just is just a, uh, it's just a different name for hyperthyroid. So Hashimoto's is gonna be with a goiter it's going to be uh, hyperthyroid and it's going to have the uh, dermatitis. That's what Hashimoto's is. So it's one of the autoimmune. So as long as it falls into autoimmune, not the secondary ones for like lithium, so on and so forth. So as long as it's autoimmune thyroid eye disease, then Tepeza certainly can be used. So Excellent. Thanks for that, Greg. Yep. No problem. So as far as presbyopic corrections, you know, this is a 
big area. There are many people who are looking for the answer, looking for the cure-all. We've seen many uh, surgically implanted corneal inlays as far as options that create a pinhole-like effect. Uh, the corneal inlay, the camera inlay that exists, id, uh, is not something that's being used any longer. The options that uh, are closest to FDA approval that are the one option that is in a phase three clinical trial right now is a very low dose pilocarpine. So low dose pilocarpine to cause uh, pupillary constriction to create that pinhole like effect. So something to keep in mind, this is reformulation of a very old medication, uh, but may have a new life for the treatment of presbyopia. So let me ask you this, you know, how do patients typically respond? You know, I shared a particular experience with a patient who is a wonderful candidate for a medication who really, you know, after more investigation, she's not sure it's for her because it's new. Uh, how do your patients typically respond? Are they the excited? If it's new, let's try it. Are they more cautious and they want to talk to you about it more before they decide on a therapy? Are they generally skeptical or are they absolutely unwilling? I think most of my patients would fall into that kind of cautious optimism category. You know, they, they want the information, uh, whether or not they really want to know the information or just want to know that there's information and good quality data that exists um, might be a different question. But, uh, you know, generally, there are certain patients who are really excited. There are others that are, you know, a little bit more likely to stick with the tried and true, which is certainly very reasonable as well. Yeah, you know, mostly that middle ground. And, and this is something where certainly looking at the results are cautiously optimistic and they want the information. I think those are the uh, very, those are very reasonable patients. Uh, I would feel the same way. I want the information before making a significant decision. So to wrap up for the last eight minutes or so, let's talk about these new retinal agents. Now, the buzzword in retina, and there's a lot of development in retinal agents, is all about durability. You're going to hear this concept over and over again. The medications, many of the medicines that we have, are, are, are have absolutely changed long-term outcomes for many patients with retinal disease. But now it's about making these agents last longer with a greater clinical effect over time. So one of these medicines that is being investigated, uh, this is again, another sustained delivery type of implant. This is the anti-VEGF agent of ranibizumab, which we know its trade name as Lucentis. And this is where a surgically implanted reservoir is inserted uh, through the conjunctiva into the vitreous and it lives suspended in the vitreous and slowly releases active Lucentis over time. This is something that patients uh, have a very good clinical impact. It works just the way that we would expect Lucentis do. And instead of needing to be seen maybe every four weeks or every five or six weeks, depending on the patient, uh, these are patients that uh, over uh, a one year period needed two visits or two fills. So it does fulfill the need for a sustained delivery implant. Remember, this is adding a permanent hardware to the eye. This is something that there are certain significant side effects that come along with that hardware as well. Bayoview of broloxizumab, uh, the anti-VEGF agent approved now more than a year ago, uh, is, has certainly is a viable anti-VEGF agent. And the exciting thing about Bayoview when it was approved is its longer duration of action. It's on label for the treatment of neovascular uh, age-related macular degeneration for 12 weeks uh, between injections after a three-month loading dose. Now, keep in mind, there is wiggle room with all of these anti-VEGF uh, anti agents. Certain patients seem to need fewer injections that can be spread over a longer period of time, and certain patients, you know, need their Avastin every four weeks like clockwork. So this is really always important that our surgical colleagues are taking really a person-centered approach. So while it might be on label for 12 week duration, patients may not be able to last as long as 12 weeks and certain patients may be able to go for longer periods of time between injections. Now there is a new agent that I just wanna to touch on that is being investigated. It's called uh, fer, sorry, Ferisimab. 
it is a dual action agent. So not just binding to anti-VEGF to bl- or binding to VEGF A to have an anti-VEGF effect, but it also binds to another molecule called ANG2 or angiopoietin 2. So this is kind of a dual mechanism of action to help to stabilize the blood retinal barrier, uh, reduce choroidal uh, or macular neovascularization in patients with neovascular macular degeneration. So something to keep in mind, there's always something else that is on uh, in the pipeline. The red flag about Bayview was last winter, there were reported vasculitis cases. This is almost, you can think of this in extreme circumstances is a similar type of occlusion this is within the eye that we saw that or that we see with giant cell arteritis. So giant cell arteritis, arteritis, systemic inflammation, inflammation of the vessels causes vascular occlusion. Now this is an, a, an anti-VEGF agent injected into the vitreous, and this has the potential to cause this pro-inflammatory retinal vascular occlusion. This is something that has the potential for significant vision loss in certain individuals. And the risk of inflammation has been described as up to 4%. That's high. You know, there are per- certain patients that should not have uh, AOVU or should not have brolixizumab. And those are patients with active intraocular inflammation. It is truly contraindicated in those patients. So is ILEA. Now, what surgeons are really doing, uh, maybe for the first time in a while, is needing to actually examine the anterior chamber in patients where they are considering injecting Bay of You to ensure that there is no subtle uh, anterior chamber reaction. You know, I've heard of this. Uh, I include it just for information's sake. You know, maybe for patients who have underlying autoimmune disease who may be more at risk of intraocular inflammation after a Bay of You injection, even if they don't have access active uveitis, you know, maybe low dose aspirin uh, could reduce the risk of vessel occlusion, inflammatory vascular occlusion. You know, this is something that hasn't been established through clinical trials, just offhanded reports by colleagues. Um, You know, patients have had wonderful responses to this particular medication, uh, but it's all about patient selection from our surgical colleagues. And this is something that uh, they have really done very well with over the last year. Cost-wise, it's up there with ILEA. Really, this means that Avastin or Bevacizumab is typically the first line anti-VEGF agent in this country. Now, my last question that I have for you that maybe I'm most curious about, you know, we know about anti-VEGF agent options. We know about Avastin, it's typically first line. What would you want as an agent that you have to pay out of pocket for if you had neovascular macular degeneration? What agent would you choose for injection for yourself, including cost? This is something that you know, colleagues in other countries where medications are, are in general le- uh, more affordable may be very different, but I'm really curious. You, know, you, you certainly know a lot about available agents and their effectiveness and, and risk of side effect. What would you choose? Just a few more results rolling in here, Jess, and I'll, I'll share the results and the poll and share. So. Excellent. I'll tell you, I chose ILEA, you know, Bay of you. I do have a history of intraocular inflammation. Uh, Bay of you, I, I would be worried about the inflammation. ILEA, you know, based on the long-term data, I think it's a wonderful option, but are you really willing to pay almost two grand a pop long-term? You know, I think, I think exactly. This is a really expected uh, type of result. Avastin, most of you, it is a wonderful agent. Lucentis has kind of lost its footing with uh, Avastin and now Ilea. Ilea is still a wonderful agent. That's, I think that's very interesting. Thanks for sharing that about yourselves. Now, gene therapy to wrap up is a world of its own that is taking over and being highly investigated in the retina space for treatment, not just of genetic disease that we've seen in uh, for the treatment of biallelic RPE65 mutation, but also for the treatment of 
neovascular macular degeneration. I want to touch on this optic trial that is uh, something that is uh, and it will be initiating its pivotal trial that it will use for submission to the FDA for potential approval. This is was awarded fast track designation by the FDA through its uh, investigation process because this is a first in class. This is a gene therapy agent for the treatment of neovascular macular degeneration. There is the injection of uh, the coding sequence that codes for a flibercept in this uh, adeno-associated viral vector that is inserted, injected into the eye. And what happens is that there is replication in the deep retinal tissue, uh, retinal cells, RPE cells uh, themselves, and a, the body produces its own aflibercept coding, uh, aflibercept protein from the instructions injected through the complementary or C DNA. This is really a very interesting process. And based on the data that's been released even recently, uh, there are certain groups that do extraordinarily well, may just need one treatment, and this lasts up to 92 weeks. So almost two years with one injection, something to be aware of. Mitochondria are a, a significant topic in macular degeneration that are really implicated in early disease development. And there are therapeutic options that are trying to focus more on early stage development of macular degeneration, dry AMD, versus looking at end stage or neovascular AMD. The complement system is overactivated in macular degeneration. So what do we talk about? Identifying a pathway that is abnormal in a disease process, check. Now finding a particular target that can be used as a treatment target. That's been done as well. C3 and C5 have been investigated. Now the next step is to design an effective molecule that blocks these particular targets. They've been developed and they're currently in clinical trials with overall fairly promising results. There are many investigations into this wide world in the complement space. Uh, it tells you that there's something to it, most likely. This is as far as treatment of macular degeneration. We're talking about the shift towards early treatment, not just geographic atrophy, but also potentially uh, early or intermediate stage dry macular degeneration. So there are a couple of agents that are currently being investigated uh, that do seem really quite promising. One that has received a little bit of a, a, a roadblock uh, was submitted to the FDA for approval in the middle of last year. This is uh, what's called um, a, a DARPEN molecule that has, a, it's a very tiny molecule that binds very effectively to VEGF to, to have an effective anti-VEGF agent. Worked very well in clinical trials. The FDA decided the risks of this medication were greater than the potential benefit in comparison to medications on the market. Uh, this was something that they determined that there was a risk of inflammation that was too significant based on uh, the available options. You know, whenever there is a significant side effect that is found out, what we saw with Bayoview, intraocular inflammation, expect the regulatory agency to pay very close attention to similar signals in new products. So, you know, if this was submitted before Bayoview for FDA approval, wouldn't be surprised if this medication was approved. But knowing what we do now and the risk of intraocular inflammation with some of these new molecules, the FDA said not at this time. Finally, stem cell therapy is not going away. Uh, it is something that is still in relatively early stages, but for patients with advanced disease is hopefully down the road going to be a potentially viable option. So I really wanted to focus on more of the medications that we can prescribe as optometrists, but also to provide you with this understanding of the larger framework that these approvals, as well as the roadblocks that exist between us prescribing a medication and our patients actually receiving and taking the medication that exists big picture impact. There are many therapeutic advancements and the role of the FDA within this larger framework is really central and, and an evolving type of perspective uh, that I think people are more interested in knowing a little bit more about than ever before. 
So new medications, you know, it starts with identifying a treatment target. There is the reformulation of existing agents, although that's certainly not as exciting as developing new agents. Ultimately, the goal is to reduce the cost of treatment. You know, you need to get the treatment first and then uh, try to reduce the cost of those treatments for the long-term impact of improving our patient's quality of life. So with that, I hand it back over to you. Thank you very much for, uh, for joining me tonight. Thank you, Jessica. That was, that was terrific. I thought it was very informative. And then actually, rep, you actually rep, represent the last two hours that we are, OEC is doing as part of the uh, emergency order. You were the, the, the last two out of our 30 hours that we did from December 1st through, through the biennium, which is the end of next week.